Uh, okay, so I'm Sophie. I already got the chance to talk to a few of you during lunch and yesterday. But for those who I uh, didn't talk to, I do my PhD here at the Donders. I'm my second year now and I'm supervised by Yama Thais, who you've seen in the morning. I mainly work with MEG data, but this is going to be on source reconstruction using beamforming. Okay, so uh, let's again have our overview slide of what you've done so far. So you've exploited the time course of uh, your data by um, doing your p-analysis and you also did spectral analysis. Uh, oh, this is coming off already. Okay, uh, and you made time frequency analysis. And now we're going to focus on the spatial aspects of your data by doing source reconstruction. And the connectivity lecture this morning was kind of already foreshadowing a little bit because um, we um, usually also reconstruct our time courses to then do connectivity analysis using that. But yeah, so when we want to make use of this spatial information in our data, we, we're going to need a uh, forward model. So for this, we usually compute a volume conduction model of our head. And then what we do is we estimate the source model parameters. Or to put it more simply, we want to go from these wiggly lines that we see in our electrophysiology physiological recordings to these beautiful blobs that you want to have in your paper. Okay, so um, again, some repetition. You've seen the slide a couple of times now, but uh, just to emphasize again this point that what we observe on the channel level is really a superposition of the underlying source activity. And so it's when we do source localization, it's not only about recovering the position of the green and the red source, but also in reconstructing these time courses. And there is a couple of characteristics of this superposition. So uh, each time source has a different visibility with respect to each channel, and each time course uh, contributes to all the channels. But how much they contribute depends on the visibility. And in the end, what we have is this linear combination uh, of the source activity. And that's important because we want to base our um, source modeling on that um, linear combination as well. So um, you've heard from Simon yesterday how um, to compute a good forward model that basically defines how our electrophysiological source projects to the channels given the volume conduction properties of your head. And now we're going to do the inverse um, problem. Specifically, we're going to zoom in on the beamforming approach. Uh, and so, uh, exactly. So just again, some repetition. So you've heard that we can do single dipole fitting, for example, where you only assume one or a, a couple of sources, and then you model them and try to find a model that best fits your data. You can also do distributed dipole models, where you actually assume a lot of source locations and you assume activity to be distributed over those and then you compu compute them in one go. Or you can do the spatial filtering which would be the beamforming approach where you don't have any prior assumptions on where exactly the sources are um, or how many there are but and also that th it's not necessarily distributed over all the sources but you assume that the time courses are uncorrelated. Okay and so many of these options are implemented in field trip. So for the, for the point-based modeling, you would use FT dipole fitting. And if you do um, a search space analysis where you either have a volumetric grid, so you predefine your, um, your source space, uh, or you could have a cortical sheet as well, then you use um, FT source analysis. So either for the distributed modeling approaches, you might use MNE or Eloretta is also implemented in field trip. And then for the beamforming approaches, there is the LCMV, the Linear Constraint Minimal Variance, which I think you've used also today in the hands-on of the connectivity. Um, or the DICS, which you would be using on oscillatory data and which you will be using this afternoon on the hands-on. And then there's the PCC, the Partial Canonical Coherence. So these are just different options that you find implemented in field trip. Mm. But before you start, um, even using these uh, FT source analysis functions. Um, when you want to do beam firming, there's already some things you can take into account earlier on, um, already at the, whoops, at the design stage of your experiment. So a couple of recommendations. Um, so for example, when you want to do beam firming, um, one thing we optimally do, because we don't specifically model um, a source um, position, but we estimate activity over the whole um, space that we've defined, you want to have some kind of contrast. So either you would have two conditions, or if that's not the case, it's uh, really recommended to have a good baseline. So here's an exemplar trial from an associative memory paradigm, where people were seeing pictures of faces, and they had to learn uh, to associate them with a point in space, like one of these points 
that you see around here, and then they would give a response. So they, they learned the association, and then they were tested on the memory of these associations. And there was also a second session, 24 hours later, where the subject would come back to the lab and again do the memory test. Uh, and what you see here is that even before the picture onset, there is a plenty of time where you have a baseline, so where <coughs> people are already um, actively attending to the stimulus, but it's not on the screen yet. So this would be um, a baseline example. Um, another recommendation, and that's maybe something you've read also today in the hands-on, um, is or a fact about beamforming is that um, it makes use of the covariance matrix. So when you do beamforming, it's important to have a long stretch of data so you get a good estimate of the covariance while still assuming a stationary signal. So some, um, someone of you asked on Monday, I think, about what does it mean when a uh, signal is stationi stationary, which I thought was really good because it's a bit of a vague concept. But you want to get a, a lot of data, basically, to have a good estimate of your covariance matrix, but you still want to make sure that you're measuring the cognitive um, process that you're interested in. So um, in this example, um, there's also a response given, but that's not actually what we want to localize. So they delayed the response um, with respect to the retrieval time window. Um, so you want to um, make sure that the time window of interest is as, as clean as possible from other con um, cognitive processes or also artifacts. So here they also had a blinking time period where people were inst instructed to blink so that you would remove, um, reduce later eye movements during the trials. And of course, don't make it too long because when people get tired, they tend to move a lot. Okay, so let's say you have the perfect design for your beamforming uh, reconstruction later. Then you still might uh, want to record other modalities such as ECG or EOG to be able to remove um, artifacts related to heart rate and so on. You also need to measure your head position in relation to the sensors, uh, for MEG especially. So we do this by using these fiducials that we have on the left and right ear and on the nasion. And you need, okay, of course you want to reduce head movement. Uh, this already starts when you place the subject in the scanner. You want to do it all carefully. And you, if you can, then you want to get a good anatomical MRI scan to get a realistic head model. And especially in beamforming, um, it's, um, the beamformer is quite uh, sensitive to an incorrect uh, head model and might become also more obvious later why. But yeah, I know a lot of you are also doing EEG. If you can get an anatomical MRI, that would be best. And then oftentimes um, you will have some kind of localizer task. So say if you're interested in the effect of memory on uh, some visual perception, then you might first do a localizer to define the visual areas you're going to um, run your contrast on. So that's always helpful to boost your sensitivity. Okay, so then uh, once you have your data, you're going to do the pre-processing. And you've already uh, had some uh, practice now with field trip and in how to segment your trials and how to uh, reduce the artifacts. Uh, okay, and then let's go back to this associative parad um, memory paradigm that I talked about. Uh, what we would uh, do there, for example, is uh, first do a time frequency analysis, where uh, now on the zero point you would have the onset of the picture, and then what you see is you get some increase in, in low oscillatory activity, which might be related to the evoked response to the stimulus, and you also get a sustained uh, decrease uh, around the 10 hertz frequency. So you might want to say, okay, I'm interested in this long de uh, decrease, so I want to beam this time frequency uh, tile. So you would then um, yeah, specify this time window, let's say from 100 milliseconds to 1.1 seconds, and you want to center uh, your window on 10 hertz. So in this case, you, would get a, you have a one second window. So this is also kind of repetition from the time frequency lecture and uh, Tuesday, or was it Monday? Monday? Tuesday. Tuesday, okay. <laughs> so you, ha uh, you would get end up with a frequency resolution of 1 hertz. If you center uh, your frequency of interest on 10 hertz, you get a bandwidth of 9.5 to 10.5. And then you could, um, so you could take this tile and you can beamform it and you would get some localized areas out. So now we have localized our um, visual response. Let's say we also want to have a contrast. So in this paradigm, as I said, we had first a memory test and then we had the second session where people came back after 24 hours. So the test right after the learning was the labile state, and then 24 hours later was the stabilized state. And so here we compute a time frequency um, and a uh, spectrum for both of these conditions. And then already at the channel level, we can look at the difference uh, between those conditions, right? So we'll get a difference that, that is then most pronounced at some sensors, and 
let's say, um, is strongest in between 700 and 900 milliseconds and has a spectral width of 20 hertz. Okay, so as I said, there's a bit of repetition, so maybe we can go through some of the things together. Uh, here you have a 200 millisecond time window. You want to center your frequency on 80. So who can tell me what might be some problems you would have if you would run FD frac analysis on this? Misha? Uh, yeah, so we're not beamforming yet. We're just uh, doing the time frequency analysis, but it's true that the window is very short. Mm -hmm. So what do we get? Uh, what kind of resolution do we get with the 200 millisecond time? Hertz. Exactly. So we get 5 hertz. So if you would center it on AD, then you would actually estimate the effect from 77.5 to um, 82.5. But you want to estimate a much broader spectrum, right? So what could you do to smooth your frequency spectrum? That's something that you've also learned. Exactly, multi-tapering. Okay, nice. So you have your um, effect, the difference between the conditions, and you say you want to center your window on 80 hertz and you want to smooth it so it, it actually goes from 65 to 95, so 15 hertz smoothing around this time uh, frequency of interest. And this would give you then for a 200 millisecond time window, five tapers, so five orthogonal tapers are going to be applied and then the Fourier spectrum of those is going to be combined, right? And then once you have construct, um, so you've specified your param parameters like this, uh, you have your uh, power estimate, and then you can beam uh, this effect and localize it. So here's the syntax of what you would do in field trip and the FT frac analysis you're already familiar with. Um, and what's important is that by default you only get the power values out. So you want to specify. You also need the phase estimate. So as I said, the beamformer relies on the covariance matrix. If you do a beamformer on spectral, uh, so oscillatory activity, then you need the counterpart to a covariance matrix in your time domain, which would be the cross-spectral frequency uh, density, which uh, Yamatais also explained this morning. Gave you all the formulas for it. For it you should be <laughs> able to know uh, what it represents. But it's really just the counterpart of the covariance. So you have to uh, explicitly specify this in the CFG.output. Okay, so this is um, everything leading up to the beamforming. And now we're going to get into the details. So if there's any questions uh, up to here. Uh, okay, I thought someone was raising the hand. Yeah, so... Um, it depends on the question you're asking, but um, say if you want to get a very um, good localization, then it's, 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 it you can increase your sensitivity um, at this source uh, reconstruction already by making like reducing the effect you're looking for already at the channel level. So it's nice to do a localization like the localizer task first, and even reduce um, the question of where your effect is in terms of the spectrum or the time window. And that's basically what we've done by um, contrasting these con conditions on the channel level is to already reduce our question of where, where this effect is coming from. Uh, okay. Can I add something here? So although we, we, we do want to reduce the effect, uh, or we want to reduce the, the, the area where the effect is, mm -hmm. it's primarily it's in time and in, and in frequency. Uh, in general, we will not be uh, zooming in on specific channels because knowing that an effect oh. is not coming from specific channels actually helps to localize the source. So if, I, if, I have, if, I, if there's no signal on this side, if I use these channels, I, I would actually use the knowledge of, the, of there not being signal on this side that the effect gets localized to the correct hemisphere. And of course, this, that's a simple example. Mm -hmm. So channels that, are, that don't have signal are still informative for localizing sources. So that's why in general, we always include all the channels in our source reconstruction. Yesterday, Simon explained um, spa uh, spatial temporal dipole fitting, like sequential dipole fitting. In, in sequential dipole fitting, it can sometimes help to work with subsets of channels, but actually only in the case of MEG. So in the case of MEG, we sometimes do sequential dipole fitting on subsets of channels to basically zoom in on one source, fit that source, and then we extend the number of channels and then start fitting the other sources. But in that, that's not something that we will be doing in beamform. We always use all the channels that we have yeah. yeah, so th um, there was this plot where the effect was specified to a couple of channels, but that's just what you get out of the, the contrast at your 
channel level condition. But yeah, it was a bit confusing. So we don't use that part of the information. That's true. But you can use prior anatomical information to, let's say, modify the, the search space in which you're going to model your source um, activity in the first place. So that's another, but I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, so the general rule that you usually do not uh, source localize your effects if you do not have statistics on sensor level? Um, like, is there some, I mean, so what do you mean? for example, you have some effects that you expect to be statistically significant. Yeah. So do you first check uh, the statistical significance on sensor level, and only then you start to source localize? So you can do both. You could also um, so source localize um, the power coming from two conditions and then contrast them. But it would be meaningful if you don't have statistical significance on sensors? Yeah, that's, I think, a question for Robert yeah. because it's not but so straightforward yeah, to it's answer. It's, it's, a, it's a very good question. So, um, in, in general, the statistical question is always a question about the brain. And you can either answer that question before source reconstruction or after source reconstruction. But once you've found the answer, once you've rejected your null hypothesis, there's no point in testing twice. So what we often try to do is we try to test only once. Mm -hmm. And um, if we first do source reconstruction, then we are increasing the massive multiple comparison problem. Because there's m a, like a large number of potential source locations at which we would subsequently have to test. Also, if we first to source reconstruction, we still don't know wh when in time it is or where in frequency it is. We have like a massive number of source locations with all the time points and all the frequencies. We have a very large representation of the data. And it makes it more difficult to, uh, to localize the effect in, the, in source space. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that, that is one of the arguments that we would use to preferably first do the statistics at the channel level and then move to source space. But sometimes it's the other way around. It's like sometimes we know what to expect the effect, like at which frequency or at which latency. And sometimes we also know that the effect at the channel level might actually be quite inconsistent over subjects because of differences in cortical folding, which causes the dipoles to project differently on the channels. And in those cases, it would actually be beneficial to do the statistics at the source level. So there's not one solution that, always, that we always use, but in general, we try to use this, the simplest solution that works for addressing the statistical question. And, and quite often um, with MEG, using combined planar gradients, um, it works fine if you do it on, on channel level data. If you do the statistical channel level data, then, only, then, only then ask the question, where is the source? Where, where the, the question, where is the source, is not a statistical question anymore, but that's an interpretation question. Mm -hmm. like the statistical question would be, is there a difference in activity between this and this condition? Mm -hmm. That's a yes-no question. But I think it, it's an interesting question. Perhaps this is also something that we can address in more detail tomorrow during the statistics lecture. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there's no further questions, <coughs> then we can get into the nitty-gritties of beamforming. So here is the ingredients that you need if you want to do a beamforming source reconstruction. You need the anatomical and the spatial information, so you need to have your volume conduction model. You need to have defined your search space in which you want to estimate the source activity. And so usually this is a 3D grid, and this is where information about the localizer task or previous anatomical information could come in, so you could just reduce this 3D grid. And you need to know the channel positions to compute the, the forward model. Uh, and then we use the functional data, and specifically our covariance data uh, matrix or the cross-spectral density to compute the inverse solution. Okay, so the question we want to ask in beamforming is what is the activity at source Q given a location R, given our data? Um, so if we have a source there at the red arrow, uh, we know how it projects uh, to all the channels. That's our forward model. We know that the uh, channel level data is a linear combination of all the source activity. So we know that we can apply a linear um, transformation to our data as well to reconstruct the source activity. So what we're looking for is a spatial filter, W, which is a set of weights that we multiply to our, uh, with our data to get the estimated time courses. And so the formula would look something like this. The estimated source, Q hat, equals um, the spatial filters W times our data. Um, and so now we're going to look at these formulas in matrix representation because it gives more of an intuition of the underlying computations. So again, if we have our source, 
it's of dimension one times the amount of uh, time points in your source time course, times the forward model, which is of dimensions number of channels. If you multiply those two vectors, <coughs> what you get is your data matrix, so the number of channels times time points. And also take, uh, so keep in mind that, uh, of course, in reality, it's uh, the, f uh, the forward model times our source time course plus noise, right? So that's we leave this out here. But um, in beamforming, we zoom in on one source, so the noise is not only the environmental noise, but actually refers to everything coming not from that source. Okay, so we know that our um, forward model, so it's also called gain matrix sometimes, that's why it's uh, called G here. So the G matrix multiplied by our uh, source time course gives us the data. But now we want to go the inverse uh, way. So we have our data, we want to estimate the time course, and we want to find these spatial filters. So these spatial filters are, should have two characteristics that I'm going to explain here. So on the x-axis you have space and you have four illustrated sources. On, on the y-axis you have the sensor sensitivity. And what we want our spatial filters to do is they should pass all the activity at our source of interest. Um, and so this would be also similar to a general filter, like when you do the single dipole fitting, you want to fit all the um, activity coming from that source and use all that activity um, to so find the best model to model this activity um, to your data. Um, but we also want to attenuate all activity coming from interfering sources, uh, so like this one, for example. So an ideal filter would look something like this box shape. We only pass activity from the source of interest and you zero out everything else. But uh, we don't have an ideal filter in reality, we have something in between. So uh, for one source, an ideal filter will look something like this, right? You attenuate everything except the source. For a different source, you would get an, a different filter. In reality, we have some spatial leakage, so it looks more like this. So this also means that when we have a true underlying source uh, time course, we want to estimate it. We're not going to get a perfect estimate, but we're going to get a blurred representation. Um, okay. And so now let's look at how these uh, constraints look uh, like how we can formalize them. So again, we have the model for our data. We want to go from data to estimated time course. We want to find the spatial filters to do this. So if you look at these two formulas, you can see that we can actually plug our data model in to the lower equation. And we can then focus on the left uh, part of the equation. So our spatial filters times the gain matrix, times the forward model. And then we can uh, get rid of the, the source time course, which we don't know, by dividing both sides by the source strength, right? So the source divided by the source is one, and also our estimated uh, source strength should be divided by the source should be one, ideally. And so this formula already fulfills the unit gain constraint, and we'll look at it with respect to the different uh, sources. Let's pretend we have a, a purple source <coughs> at the purple error location. We're gonna compute a spatial filter relating to that. That multiplied <coughs> with the respective forward model um, would have one as the um, filter output, so we have the unit gain passband. And then for, okay, we zoom in. We zoom in to a different source, like the blue one. We would compute a different set of spatial filters. Again, if we uh, multiply this one with the forward model of that specific co uh, source, it should equal one. But we also want to attenuate activity coming from all other sources. So if we would uh, take the spatial filter for the purple source and multiply it with the forward model of the blue one, we want that to be zero, because we want to attenuate, the spatial filter should attenuate activity coming from there. Um, and so this also maybe makes more clear why it's so important to have a correct forward model, because if your forward model is incorrect, then you're actually going to suppress source activity that you would want to model. Okay, and uh, we want this, uh, to be true for the spatial filter, so these two relations for all other um, potential source locations as well. So if we would have a green, a third source, a green one, um, again, the spatial filter of the purple uh, source times the forward model should be zero, and so forth for all other combinations. So now we formalized our two uh, constraints. Our spatial filter times the gain matrix equals one, but our spatial filter times the gain matrix for a different source should equal zero. And so this would work if, there, if our sources were completely independent, but that's not really the case. So mathematically, the, the second constraint cannot generally be fulfilled. So instead of making it zero, we just want to make it as small as possible, which means that we want to minimize the variance at the filter output, which is the variance of the source, so uh, which is the source strength in the end. So let's look at how we minimize um, this variance. 
<coughs> we uh, have our model for the estimated uh, source time courses, our spatial filters times the data matrix, and we want to minimize the output, so the variance at the source. The variance at the source is simply the time course of the source times the time course transposed, so the sum of um, squares divided by n, but we're only going to focus on this part. And uh, you can see again that we have a model for our estimated uh, source. So we can just plug it in and the transposed version of this. And if you now focus on the middle part of this equation, you might notice that we have our data matrix times our data matrix transpose, which is our covariance matrix. So this is how uh, we get back to the covariance, the magic of beam forming. Um, OK, so the nice thing is now that having those two constraints, we now can see that there is a formula to uh, estimate our spatial filters um, while they still minimize um, the variance at the source. Uh, and this is the formula that does that. You don't uh, need to understand fully how we derived at this formula, but it's so you can derive it given those two constraints. If you want to know the exact math behind it, there's a paper by Van Veen et al. from 1997 where they go through it step by step. But what's really important to understand is that your spatial filters can be computed uh, given nothing more than just the gain matrix, so your forward model, and the covariance of your data, which is the, the two things that we can estimate. Um, so that's nice. And this um, equation also fulfills the unit gain constraint. So if you remember, the unit gain constraint was defined by our spatial filters times the forward model equals 1. So if we would multiply our spatial filters by the forward model... Oh no, this is missing. Okay, imagine. <laughs> spatial filters times g, you would um, multiply both sides by g. What you would get is this, um, this term here would be exactly the same as in here, only that this is the inverse. And an inverse, so a matrix taken multiplied by its inverse is the identity matrix. So the unit gain constraint is still fulfilled. Uh, OK. I'm not sure what's up next, actually. <laughs> Ah, okay, there it is. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> okay, blank slide. So, um, yeah, this was the math behind how we estimate the time course at one source location. So the question now is how does this scale up? So we have our uh, um, head model and we know how it's located with respect to the sensors and we have to find our sp um, search space, which is usually a 3D grid. And then we just estimate the spatial filters using this formula for each um, location in this grid over and over again until we have a whole spatial distribution of our source strength. And then we can do this for two conditions and we can contrast them. And what we would get out is some local maxima where we can then localize the sources. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the strengths and the limitations of a beamformer. So uh, first of all, um, with the beamforming, you estimate the activity in this whole 3D space that you've defined, and it's the same for all subjects. So you can easily average over subjects, while when you do the single dipole fitting, uh, the dipoles might vary a little bit in orientation and, uh, um, and the moment. So that's, that's the same, so location and orientation. So it's going to be hard to sometimes decide which ones go together. So we estimate uh, all the time, uh, all the source points, and we also do it independently for each time, um, time for e sorry, for each source point. So this also makes it very suitable for the SPM-like statistics. But we don't make any assumptions about how many sources there are um, or where they are. We also don't assume necessarily that activity is distributed over all sources, which can make the results in beamforming a little bit more spatially focal compared to, for example, the distributed modeling. But since we estimated each time point independently, there's also this implicit assumption that the sources are uncorrelated. And, of course, that's in reality not the case. So we're going to go through what this could entail. So here's the paper again that I mentioned from Van Veen et al., 1997. They did some simulations about the correlation of sources and how this might affect the beamforming outcome. So what you see here is two slices through the hat where X and Y define the space. And then in the z-direction, you get uh, the strength of your estimated time course. And there's two scenarios. One where there's two sources opposite on opposite ends of the space, and two that are more closely uh, located. So if you now estimate the time course, what you see is that uh, when they're uh, uncorrelated, you can nicely um, distinguish between spatially. You also get a good estimate of their strength. Uh, 
for both cases. But now if there's a mild correlation, you can see that for the sources that were located close to each other, uh, you actually um, cannot really spatially distinguish between, between them anymore. And also your estimate of the strength is a bit biased towards one source or the other. And then even worse, if we have a perfect correlation in our sources, the estimate you would get is actually coming from the center of your head in the case of the two far apart sources. Or you would only estimate one source where there's actually two really close together. So that's just something you need to keep in mind uh, when you want to beam forming. Like what are the underlying assumptions that you have for your sources generating the effect you're interested in? And there is, um, uh, yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, so as, as Robert already said, we usually don't try to like level out the, the channels. You could, no, no, like yeah, you could, you could theori the theoretically restrict your source space, I guess. Um, but actually I'm going to give an example. Um, because, so in reality, you actually don't really have perfectly correlated sources. You don't have to be perfectly uncorrelated sources. So let's go through one practical example where you <coughs> might actually make your sources more correlated than you would want. Um, so um, one real life case would be if you have binaural auditory simulation. So let's say you uh, present a tone to both ears simultaneously. And then usually um, we, could, we could compute an evoked potential, right? Where you have a, an auditory um, um, yeah, deflection. Um, so in auditory areas, you would have this deflection around 100 milliseconds after stimulus onset. And uh, if you would now want to localize this, what could you do? So you could t take this average and then compute the covariance. You just call FG time log analysis again for this, uh, specifying CFG covariance, yes, because that's what you need for your beamformer. And then you could pass this activity to the FG source analysis, and you would get something like this. So that um, refers back to the examples I just showed you in the simulations. You kind of estimate uh, something in the temporal areas, but you also get this strong source in the middle. So you don't want this, but by averaging, you've actually gotten rid of the variance that is in your signal on a trial by trial basis. Like that's the definition of averaging. Um, and you've made the uh, sources even more correlated um, by doing the average, right? So you can actually exploit this variance that you have on the trial by trial basis. And instead of taking the average, just compute the covariance on your data itself. And if we pass this one to the LCMV um, beamformer, we already get a much better estimate. So for mild correlations, even in this case, where there was binaural auditory stimulation, you can still reconstruct them more or less okay. But you need to, you need to take into account how you pre-process your data before you start doing the source localization. Okay, so um, I'm already through the lecture. I'm just gonna give a brief summary. So beamforming and beamforming is a source reconstruction method where we estimate each point independently. We do that by finding a spatial filter and these spatial filters pass all the activity at our source uh, of interest, and they inhibit all the activity coming from other sources. Uh, and for that, we make use of the covariance. You've now seen why. Uh, and also we use the forward model, of course. And so I've explained the beamformer in the time domain, so an LCMV beamformer, but uh, it's often used uh, on oscillatory data. And then it works with the cross-spectral density, and you will also be doing this on the hands-on, but you can use it for both. You don't need any prior assumptions about how many sources you have, which is nice, but you need to take into account if there are some correlations. So then it might be better to either uh, exploit the variance on a trial by trial basis or move to a different reconstruction method. Okay, that's all I had to say. So are there any questions? <coughs>